Continuing on chapter 2 of physical chemistry, beginning chapter 2.6, let's talk about heat capacity, a very important quantity. Now, actually, there are different types of heat capacity that is specific to a process. So we have the heat capacity of a process, uh, PR, short for process. Now, for any process, the heat capacity is defined by the differential of heat as it changes with temperature. Now, this is actually capital C, which is extensive, which is equal to the intensive C times mass. Lowercase c is specific heat or specific heat capacity. Capital C is our uh, heat capacity of the whole system, which is extensive. Now, um, there are a couple of important types of heat capacity. One is for a constant process, so a constant pressure process. So we have subscript pressure, P. So CP is equal to the change in heat at constant pressure as it changes with temperature. And that, of course, we know is equal to the change in enthalpy as it changes with temperature at constant pressure. We showed that how last slide, that the um, change in enthalpy is equal to dQ at constant pressure. What this tells us that heat enthalpy is actually a function of temperature and pressure. Now, for also for a constant volume process, then we have the specific heat subscript V, which is defined as the change in heat at constant um, volume as it changes with temperature. And again, we showed before how at constant volume that dQ is equal to del del delta U, or du. So we have the change in internal energy with respect to temperature at constant volume. So what this tells us is that U is internal energy is actually a function of temperature and volume. Now, CP and CV are state functions. They're never equal to zero. They're always positive. Now, CP and CV, later on in this chapter, we're going to come up with some ways to estimate them. And then when we get to quantum mechanics, we'll come up with better ways to explain them. But for now, they're experimentally measured. CP, now we're going to do some algebra. We're just going to take CP minus CV, substitute in these we found here. So CP minus CV is equal to the change in enthalpy with respect to temperature at constant pressure, minus the change in the internal energy with respect to temperature at constant volume. Now remember, H is U plus PV. So taking this and substituting in, we have CP minus CV is equal to the change in U plus PV with respect to temperature at constant pressure still, minus the change in internal energy with respect to temperature at constant volume. Now, you can always just split apart addition when you're taking a derivative. So we're going to split it apart this U and the PV. So that gives us the derivative of U with respect to temperature at constant pressure, plus P times the differential of volume with respect to temperature at constant pressure, minus the differential of U with respect to temperature at constant pressure. Remember, we can pull this P out of the PV because it's at constant pressure. Okay, continuing on chapter 2 of physical chemistry, we're in chapter 2.6. Last time we ended up with this equation. The heat capacity constant pressure minus the heat capacity constant volume is equal to the derivative of volume with respect to temperature at constant pressure plus pressure times the derivative of volume with respect to temperature at constant pressure. Oh, no, wait, this is internal energy. This is U. Let's see if I can make that more readable. Okay, that makes more sense. All right, and then this also is the derivative of U with respect to temperature at constant volume. Remember, these don't cancel out because this is constant pressure, this is constant volume. We're going to come back to this equation, so we'll call that equation 1 for now. Now remember that U, internal energy, is a function of temperature and volume. We saw why on the last slide. So in differential, the total differential for du would be the derivative of U with respect to T at constant volume, dT, plus the derivative of U with respect to volume at constant temperature, dV. What we're going to do is take this differential and impose constant pressure on it. So we're just going to add the subscript P here, here, and here. So then we are going to divide by the differential of temperature, still at constant P, because we're now we're assuming it's a constant pressure process. So we end up with the differential of volume at constant, no, internal energy. 
Oops, make sure that's a U. Okay, the differential of internal energy U at constant pressure divided by the differential of temperature at constant pressure is equal to the differential of U at constant temperature at constant volume plus the differential of U with respect to volume at constant temperature times the differential of volume at constant pressure divided by the differential of temperature at constant pressure. Notice this DTP canceled out here. Now, we're going to use this and we're going to subtract it back into our equation 1. So, what we have here is the, the differential, oops, CP minus CV is equal to the differential of U with respect to temperature at constant volume plus the differential of U with respect to volume at constant temperature times the differential of volume with respect to temperature at constant pressure plus pressure times the differential of volume with respect to temperature at constant pressure minus the differential of internal energy with respect to temperature at constant volume. Now, we have constant volume terms that match up, so these will cancel out. And here, both terms have a differential of volume with respect to temperature at constant pressure. So we're going to factor this out. What that gives us is that the specific heat at, um, no, it's not specific, it's just heat capacity at constant pressure minus the heat capacity at constant volume is equal to the differential of U with respect to V at constant temperature plus P times the differential of volume with respect to temperature at constant pressure. Notice these two terms are added, therefore they must have the same units. So what we know now is that the differential of internal energy with respect to volume at constant temperature has units of pressure. This term is called internal pressure. <clears throat> Continuing on chapter 2 of physical chemistry, we're just now finishing up chapter 2.6. We showed before that the heat capacity at constant pressure minus the heat capacity at constant volume is equal to the derivative of internal energy with respect to volume at constant temperature plus the pressure and all that quantity times the differential of volume with respect to temperature at constant pressure. We also show that the differential of um, internal energy with respect to volume at constant temperature must have units of pressure, and this term is called the internal pressure. Chapter 2.7, we're going to see how you count or measure that. Now, none of these terms here is equal to zero. Therefore, we can say that the difference between the heat capacity constant pressure and the heat capacity constant volume is not equal to zero. Therefore, they're not equal to each other. Now, we defined before that the heat capacity constant pressure is equal to the differential of heat with respect to temperature at constant pressure. And likewise, the heat capacity constant volume is equal to the differential of heat at constant volume with respect to temperature. Now, remember, dqp then is equal to the heat added at constant pressure, and dqv is the heat added at constant volume. Now, we know that the differential of internal energy U is equal to the differential of heat plus the differential of work. That was the first law of thermodynamics. Likewise, we know that the differential of heat at constant pressure is equal to the differential of U at constant pressure minus the differential of work. We just solve that for constant, for dq and impose constant pressure on it. Since it's constant pressure, we know that that dqp is equal to the differential of internal energy constant pressure plus pdv. Remember that this minus negative would be cancel out, make a positive. So we have the differential at q at constant volume would also be equal to the differential of internal energy constant volume plus zero because. Um, at constant volume, dV is equal to zero, therefore the differential of work is equal to zero. And of course then the total work would be equal to zero if we were to integrate that. So, we know that the differential of heat at constant pressure is not equal to the differential of heat at constant volume. The reason is because the differential of heat at constant pressure, this includes the expansion work, but the differential of heat at constant volume does not include expansion work. Both of them include U, which internal energy, which is what they have in common. So we know that CP minus CV is proportional to the change in heat at constant pressure minus the change in heat at constant volume. And that's equal to the change in internal energy at constant pressure 
minus the internal energy at constant volume, plus pressure differential of volume. Now, these terms affect different states of matter. The differential of U at constant pressure and the differential U at constant volume, this applies to solids and liquids because it's a result of internal energy. Solids and liquids, they have internal energy because their molecules are close enough that intermolecular attractions. They have intermolecular attractions. On the other hand, PDB, that applies to the gaseous phase because the gaseous phase is the one that will have a big change in volume if you change the temperature or anything. Increase heat, add heat. Okay, continuing on chapter 2.7 of physical chemistry, we, um, want, we talked about last time about internal pressure. It has it units of pressure. How do we measure it though? Well, Joule did an experiment to find it for gases. This is his experiment. He has an adiabatic container. Inside of that, he fill, has water. And then inside of that, he has this two-part system. On the left, it started out with gas only. And on the right, it started out with a hard vacuum. And in between, he had a valve. And then he can measure the temperature of the water with a thermometer. Remember, the gas, this heat can go between the gas and the water. So if the gas were to absorb heat or anything, it would change the temperature of the water, and you could tell that with the thermometer. So we start out with the gas originally at P1, B1, and T1. If you open the stopper, allow the gas to fill up both sides of the container, then you end up with a second pressure, volume, and temperature. Now remember, Q equals zero because we said this wall is adiabatic. We also know that we're not doing any work. The reason is because our gas is expanding against a vacuum, not an external pressure. So for one, there's no external pressure. And the formula D work, reversible, equals minus PDV is the external pressure. But the other thing too, of course, is that this is only for reversible work. This is not a reversible process at all. Therefore, the formula does not even apply at all. Now we know that the change in internal energy is equal to Q plus W. For this system, we know that Q is zero and work is equal to zero. Therefore, delta U must be equal to zero, which means, of course, U2 is equal minus U1 equals zero. Therefore, the final internal energy is equal to the initial internal energy. Now, Joule, he didn't see any difference. He, that, this is what he concluded. So he, he says that the derivative of internal energy with respect to volume at constant temperature is equal to zero. Now we know though from before that internal energy U is a function of temperature and volume. So writing that the exact differential, we have the differential of U is equal to the derivative of U with respect to volume at constant temperature, dV, plus the derivative of U with respect to temperature at constant volume, dT. Well, we know for this experiment, Joule did, that dU is equal to zero. We also know that this derivative of U with respect to temperature constant volume dT is equal to zero. Therefore, this other term must also be zero. Now, this is true for an ideal gas. It turns out it's not true for a real gas. His experiment just wasn't good enough to show that. Okay, continuing on, chapter 2.7 of physical chemistry, we're talking about the Joule experiment still. We have a variable, or constant, actually, anyway, we have a mu sub j, that's the joule coefficient. We're defining mu sub j as the differential of temperature with respect to volume at constant internal energy. And we want to compare this with the differential of internal energy with respect to volume at constant temperature. We're going to have to go back to our calculus rules for that. Remember the Euler relation. Let's say that z is a function of x and y. We can draw all three variables in a circle like this so we keep track of our order. And we're going to use the cyclic rule of partial differentiation. So what this gives us is that the derivative of x with respect to y holding z constant times the derivative of y with respect to z holding x constant times the derivative of z with respect to x holding y constant is equal to negative 1. Hopefully when you took multivariate calculus you um, were taught that. Now we know that u is a function of temperature and volume. 
therefore, using the um, same rule here, we have the differential of temperature with respect to internal energy, constant volume, times the differential of internal energy with respect to volume at constant temperature, times the differential of volume with respect to temperature at constant internal energy is equal to negative 1. Now, what we want to do is um, solve for this one. So, we have the differential of volume with respect to U, constant temperature, is equal to minus 1 over the differential of temperature with respect to volume times constant in, at constant internal energy, times the differential of internal energy with respect to temperature at constant volume. Flipping that upside down, we get minus the differential of volume with respect to temperature at constant internal energy times the differential of temperature with respect to internal energy at constant volume. We can just flip all that upside down, this basic algebra, fractions. So we have the differential of internal energy U with respect to volume at constant temperature is equal to minus the differential of temperature with respect to volume at constant internal energy U times the differential of U with respect to temperature at constant volume. Now these terms should both look familiar. This first one here is equal to mu j, because we define mu j as the differential of temperature with respect to volume at constant u. And the second term here should look a lot like constant volume, because we define constant volume as the differential of internal energy with respect to temperature at constant volume. Continuing on physical chemistry, chapter 2.7, we're just finishing up the Joule experiment. So last time we showed that the derivative of internal energy with respect to volume at constant temperature is equal to minus the derivative of temperature with respect to volume at constant internal energy times the derivative of internal energy with respect to temperature at constant volume. And then we showed, well, this term is equal to mu jt, or no, just mu j, joule constant coefficient. And then this term is equal to the heat capacity at constant volume. So therefore, we know that the derivative of internal energy with respect to volume at constant temperature is equal to minus the heat capacity times the joule coefficient. Now, we know that Cv, the heat capacity at constant volume, cannot be equal to zero. Therefore, for a perfect gas, we can say that mu j is equal to zero. Now, along the same lines, there's another experiment by um, Joule and Thompson. Later on, Thompson became known as Lord Kelvin. So it's known as either the Kelvin-Joule experiment or the Joule-Thompson experiment. So we have this tube here, and we have a force valve in between two parts. This force valve is also known as a throttling valve. And this is at a fixed position. On both sides, we have a piston. And we're starting out with all of the gas on the left side of our valve. So what we're going to do is very slowly and reversibly push in this piston, and then the gas will push out this piston. Now the purpose of this valve is because we're changing the pressure. Even though it's officially reversible, P1 is greater than P2. So we're going to do this slowly and reversibly. Now this, these are both constant proce pressure processes. Therefore, the, the work on the left side is just minus P1 times the change of volume. So we get positive P1V1. So this side is doing work on the gas. The work on the right side on the end, it's also constant pressure. So we get P2 times the change of volume, but this is going to be minus. So the um, gas is doing work on this piston. Now we said that Q equals zero because these are adiabatic walls here. This is an adiabatic system. And we know that um, for an adiabatic system, delta U is going to be equal to the net work. That's from the first law of thermodynamics. Now we can write work net as P1V1 minus P2V2. Now, we also know that delta U, in this case, since Q equals zero, is um, delta U2 minus U1, because it's a state function. So that's equal to P1V1 minus P2V2. Now, if we rearrange this, equation, then we're going to get U, all the 2's on one side and all the 1's on another side. So we get U2 plus P2V2 is equal to U1 plus P1V1. And that, continuing on chapter 2.7 of physical chemistry, 
where I'm just finishing up the Joule experiment. We showed before that the derivative of internal energy with respect to volume at constant temperature is equal to minus the derivative of temperature with respect to volume at constant internal energy times the derivative of internal energy with respect to temperature at constant volume. Now, this first term is equal to mu j, and the second term is equal to the heat capacity at constant volume. Therefore, the derivative of internal energy with respect to volume at constant temperature is equal to minus the heat capacity at constant volume times the Joule coefficient. Now, we know that the heat capacity can't be equal to zero. Therefore, for a perfect gas, we know that mu j is equal to zero. Now, a similar experiment was done by um, Joule Thompson, or uh, Joule Kelvin. J uh, Thompson later became known as Lord Kelvin. Okay, so here's our experiment. We have this adiabatic tube, and we have two pistons in them separated by a force valve, or a throttling valve. Now, this valve is in a fixed position, and we're starting out with all the gas on one side. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to slowly and reversibly push this piston in all the way to the force valve, which will force the gas through the valve, and then which will in turn push the piston out this way. Now, the purpose of the valve is so that we can have P1 greater than P2. But other than that, it's still officially a reversible process, even though you couldn't actually reverse it. Okay, so the work on the left, because it's constant pressure, is basically P delta V. So we have P1 V1. And that's positive because we're doing work on the gas. The work on the right here is also constant pressure, therefore it's P delta V, we get minus P2 V2, because the gas is going to be doing work on the piston. Now we have um, Q equals zero, because we have adiabatic walls. And um, so by the first law of thermodynamics, the change in internal energy is going to be equal to the net work. The net work would be just P1 V1 minus P2 V2. Now we no, then the delta u is equal to u2 minus u1 because it's the state function. And since it's equal to work net, we, it's equal to p1. Okay, continuing on uh, physical chemistry, chapter 2.7, we're just finishing up the Joule experiment. Now, in the Joule experiment, we showed that the derivative of u with respect to v at constant t is equal to minus the derivative of t with respect to v at constant u times the derivative of u with respect to t at constant v. Now this term is equal to mu j, this term is equal to cv. Substituting that back in, then we have the derivative of internal energy with respect to volume at constant temperature is equal to minus the heat capacity at constant volume times the Joule coefficient. Now we know the heat capacity cannot be equal to zero. This it was experimentally found to be zero. Therefore, for a perfect gas, we can say that mu j is equal to zero. Now, Joule Thompson experiment, or the Kelvin Joule experiment, since um, Thompson got known by Lord Kelvin later on, we have adiabatic walls. This is a tube here, a pipe. We've got a force valve in between, which is basically a throttle. It's like a cork or something. So we have two pistons, one of over here is far left, one of them is right up next to the throttling valve. And then we have gas in here. So what we're going to do is very slowly, we're going to push this piston in, so the gas will get forced through this valve and push this second piston out here. Now, we're, this is not really a reversible experiment, because P1 is greater than P2. But we're going to do this slowly enough that this part's considered reversible, this part's considered reversible. So we can use all the calculations that we've been doing so far. Now, the work done by the left side is equal to minus P1 times the change in volume. Since we're doing work on the system, that's going to end up positive P1 V1. Then the work on the right side, this is going to be the work done by the gas. This is going to be minus P2 times delta V. So we end up with minus P2 V2. So the net work is going to be just P1 V1 minus P2 V2. Now, remember, we know that Delta U is equal to Q plus W, but in this case, Q is equal to zero because it's adiabatic. So what we have is delta U, remember, is U2 minus U1, since U is a state function. So we have P1 V1 minus P2 V2, because in state 1, all the gas is over here, and in state 2, all the gas will be over here.
continuing on physical chemistry, chapter 2.7, uh, we're doing the Joule-Thomson experiment still. So we showed before how the Joule-Thomson experiment, because it's adiabatic, we have delta U is just equal to P1V1 minus P2V2, because uh, U2 minus U1 is a state function. U is a state function. So we solve for, just have state 1 on one side, state 2 on the other side. So we have U1 plus P1V1 is equal to U2 plus P2V2. Now remember, we defined enthalpy as U plus PV. Therefore, the enthalpy in state 2 is equal to the enthalpy in state 1, or delta enthalpy is equal to 0. So this means that the Joule-Thomson experiment is constant enthalpy. Now we're going to define another term. This is mu sub JT, capital J, capital T. So that's the Joule-Thomson coefficient, which is not the same as the Joule coefficient. This one is defined as the derivative of temperature with respect to pressure at constant enthalpy. Now this is a measurable quantity. We're going to be explaining how to measure it in just a bit. It is gas specific and it depends on the conditions. Now this one can be positive, negative, or zero. Typical range for gases would be from about minus 0.1 degrees Celsius per atm to about 3 degrees Celsius per atm. Now I have here a graph of temperature against pressure, increasing temperature this way, increasing pressure that way obviously. This is one curve for a gas beginning at constant enthalpy. Now there is a place where it levels out, maxes out. This of course if you've taken calculus you'll know that's where the um, mu jt is equal to zero. This is called the inversion point. Below this, that we have a mu jt is greater than zero. And above this, we have mu jt is less than zero. Now, um, if the mu jt is greater than zero, that means when it expands, it's going to cool. But for mu jt greater than, less than zero, then when the gas expands, it's going to um, warm up. Now, <clears throat> to find uh, this information, what we're going to do, <coughs> excuse me, is repeat the same Joule-Thompson experiment, but with different um, starting conditions, like a different volume uh, for V1 or different pressure for P1 and so on. And we're going to keep repeating that. Now, of course, P2, like I said before, is greater than P1, but um, other than that, we're treating it as reversible for the purpose of calculations. Okay, continuing chapter, <coughs> excuse me, chapter 2.7, Physical Chemistry, we're continuing the Joule-Thompson experiment. What we are going to do is repeat the same experiment with the same starting conditions, P1 and T1, but we're going to vary the right side to P2, T2, P3, T3, or P4, T4. So we're going to um, do that, and we're going to create this isenthalpic curve, or isenthalp. Notice we're graphing temperature against pressure like we did before. So if we do this experiment once, we can calculate the change in temperature with respect to pressure at constant enthalpy, um, delta, a discrete change. <clears throat> now if we can repeat that experiment, the whole thing, but this time with a different um, left side. So we'll start out with P1, T1 prime, P1, T1 prime, et cetera, going to different um, temperatures, pressures on the right side. So we can create a whole bunch of these isenthalps. And each one of these isenthalps is going to have a maximum where mu jt is equal to zero. And we're going to connect all those points to create yet another curve. Now remember, where mu jt is equal to zero, this is where a gas will expand and the temperature will not increase nor decrease. Okay, continuing on chapter um, 2.7 of physical chemistry, we know that enthalpy is a function of temperature and pressure. So if we write it out, um, we get the differential of enthalpy is equal to the derivative of enthalpy with respect to temperature at constant pressure times the differential at temperature, plus the differential at enthalpy with respect to pressure constant temperature times the differential of pressure. This is called the slope formula. So this will give us the slope at constant P, this will give us the slope at constant T. Now this part here, the derivative of enthalpy with respect to pressure constant temperature, this is equal to minus Cp times mu Jt, or just mu T. And most of the time when the engineers want to work with gases, they want the um, gas to cool when it expands, 
which means they want mu jt is greater than zero. Now let's talk about the BP oil rig leak that happened in the Gulf of Mexico. So here's the surface of the water. About 5,000 feet, or almost one mile down, was the sea floor. First thing we need to do is figure out what was the pressure down there. Well, we know rho is density. So what we're going to do is use the pressure is equal to rho gh. So density times gravitational acceleration times the height, or in this case, the depth, however you want to call that. So you take 1,030 kilograms per meter cubed for the density of water, times 9.81 meters per second squared for the acceleration of gravity here on Earth, times 1,524 meters, because that's the depth. We don't want it in feet. That'll give us 1.54 times 10 to the 7 pascals. Converting, that'll give us 152 ATM. <clears throat> okay, continuing chapter uh, 2, finishing up chapter 2.7 of physical chemistry. So we started talking about um, the... British Petroleum Oil Spill and the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico. And we calculated that the pressure of the water at the bottom there is 152 ATM. And the pressure of the oil of the gas is about 460 ATM. And we're assuming that the water starts out about 5 degrees Celsius. So what we're going to do is the gas, as it comes out of the well and it leaks into the water, there's going to be a pressure change for it, which of course is just P2 minus P1. So we're going to subtract 152 ATM minus 460 ATM. What that means is that the pressure of the oil and gas is going to decrease by 308 ATM. Now remember, water at the bottom of the uh, ocean there, it's at its highest density, about 4 degrees Celsius. Now we know that mu JT is about 0 0.265 kelvins per ATM. That's for a mixture of hydrogen and CH4, like would be found in an oil well. Now remember, mu jt is the derivative of temperature with respect to pressure at constant enthalpy. What we're going to just assume is that constant, so we'll just have delta t over delta p, constant enthalpy. And again, this is just assuming that the mu jt is constant, so we can do a simple calculation. So what we're going to have is the change in temperature then is roughly equal to the mu jt times the change in pressure. So we take 0 0.265 kelvins per atm, multiply that by negative 308 atm. What we're going to find is that the temperature is going to decrease by 81.6 kelvins. So to find our final temperature, we'll just take our initial temperature and add that change in temperature. So we're going to start with 278 kelvins. That might actually be a little high, but anyway, we're going to add this change in temperature, 80, negative 81.6 kelvins. And we're going to get 196.4 kelvins or negative 76.6 degrees Celsius. We all know water is going to freeze about zero degrees Celsius. Therefore, the gas leaking out of the oil well is going to cause the water around it to freeze. <laughs>